Hey guys, Matthew here from Flight Club Life, just uh, following up on Float Week, and we're here to talk to you all about floats. Uh, we do have a guest pilot, uh, Andrew Keys. He's worked at a couple of different float uh, outfits, and he's going to impart some of his knowledge here. He's also shared some amazing, amazing pictures with us, and uh, we'll go through them as he's, as he's talking. Now, unfortunately, Andrew's all the way up north, so we weren't able to do a go live session with him, but he's called in here, and that's why this one's pre-recorded. But I think you guys are going to love the information that he has to share, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm sure Andrew would be uh, willing to, to answer them at a, at a later time. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. No worries. Um, Andrew, let's just let's just jump straight into it. Um, how how did you get started in in floats, and what what was your journey in aviation? Uh, well, how I got started was uh, I first started through the Air Canada program, and I got to my glider license, and then my private pilot license. Uh, then I flew around home for a little, little bit. Went to school in Thunder Bay um, uh, Confederation College. They have uh, they had a really good uh, float program. That's the reason I went there. Ended up canceling that, so I went and uh, got my full rating after I was done school on my own. Uh, got a job in Sulacote, Ontario, uh, flying for Slate Falls, um, uh, Slate Falls uh, Airways, and then uh, we're there for the whole uh, summer, flying the 206 on floats. Also worked the dock a little bit, and then the winter flew the 206 on wheels. And then in the following spring, I moved uh, to just outside Vermilion Bay. I uh, worked for a place called Clark's Resort Snow Coast, uh, also air service. Uh, started flying the Beaver for them. Uh, last summer, I flew the Beaver full time. And then this summer, uh, I've been on the order. Now, I'll go back to your schooling. It's funny because anything in, in aviation, there always seems to be drawbacks, no matter what happens. Like any anytime you have a plan, make sure that you have conditions contingencies and luckily you were able to find somewhere else when they canceled the the float program at your school yeah it wasn't the end of the world because it was still a great school to go to but uh mm -hmm. um yeah definitely i was really looking forward to that uh, most places you go you know you get seven hours of full training but they use uh, offer 14 so uh <laughs> that's just the way it goes so they offered a ifr a group three ifr instead so awesome. it still came out ahead yeah so why, why float planes? What made you decide to go with float planes? Uh, the whole reason I uh, really like float planes is because I really like boats, uh, old boats, wood boats. I like old cars and trucks and everything. Most float planes are from the 1950s, all the have ones. They're all 50s. We've got uh, right from early 50s to end, old, uh, right to 59, really. So uh, just seeing iconic um Bush planes, you know, to have a beaver and the otter, uh, like a lot of people uh, would really like to fly those. And you've always seen old pictures in the past when everyone was mapping out the north, they were always in a beaver. Uh, so it's just really cool to go uh, fly one of the old planes that all the old time pilots have flown. And, and uh, yeah, I just really like that. And then the other reason was just because I'd like uh, just to kind of being your own boss. You know, you're, you're out there making your own decisions. It's not like a uh, pilot's on the runway, you get where you're going, you either go come in, uh, you know, west or east, you only got one option, one or the other. Whereas uh, you go to a lake, you've never been there before, you have, uh, you got to find where the rocks are, where you got to get to the shore, you got all kinds of things to think about. Um, we have the waves are too big, how are you going to try to get out of the waves, uh, what are you going to do if the wind changes? All kinds of things, you, you know, you could be the first one never into a lake, and uh, you have to figure it out all for yourself. Yeah, there's definitely no uh, no tower or weather or anyone to tell you what to do. No, nothing. No, no autopilot, nothing. Uh, just just, uh, just your map, you know, figure it out. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I don't know what I would do if I was flying floats. I am so bad with a map. I need the, the GPS and the little dotted line to tell me where to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, we're all getting that way too. They all have uh, they all have GPSs, but you know, some some aren't as good as others, and sometimes they don't always work. You know, they always tell you in school that uh, you, you need to know how to use the map because your GPS might fail, and you you think that's that's a lie, but I've had it fail before, and I've had to use the map. So, 
And sometimes, uh, you know, you'll get somewhere and they'll just tell you where to go. They'll just draw it on your map. So you might as well just use the map to get there. <laughs> awesome. What What does a entry-level float job look like? Uh, well, uh, kind of before COVID-19 happened, uh, most uh, most people, you know, you, you would either go someplace and get your float rating, get your seven hours, but anyone can do a float rating with a commercial license and 50 hours on floats. So uh, it was getting to the point where most outfitters would would um, just allow you to come uh, and they're going to do a lot of training with when you're a new pilot anyways. You know, they might do 20, 30 hours of training. So they're going to cover your seven hour basic mm -hmm. uh, float rating. So then they would sign off on you. So you, you would normally come to a company, you would work the dock, uh, and then fly whatever their airplane is, like their smallest airplane, mostly Super Cub, maybe it's a Cessna 180, 185, 206. Uh, my my first job was right into a 206, uh, but where I work now is, is a uh, uh, all the new pilots get into a Super Cub. So usually your first season is uh, working the dock, flying a little bit um, in the smaller airplane, and also just uh, doing ride-alongs with, with other pilots. Sometimes they need a hand. Uh, just depends, you know, what, what uh, kind of load you have or what the wind's doing. They might need a hand. So you do a lot of ride-alongs, and while you're riding along, you're learning. So mm -hmm. you kind of transition from, from that uh, smaller plane to maybe your second year would be on a Cessna 180, 185, 206. And then from there, you'd move on to a Beaver. And usually after a year or two or so on a beaver, you'd move on to an otter, a caravan, uh, such planes. And yeah, that's usually about the biggest planes that most people have. So um, I'm looking at a picture here where, where you've loaded a, a boat onto the side of the plane. Why, like, why would you carry a boat? And how difficult is it to load a boat onto a plane? Well, all the flying that, uh, that we do is there's two types of flying that we're doing. Uh, one where we work is Clark's uh, Resorts and Outposts. So there's 30 outposts, uh, which is just a remote lake anywhere from 60 to 130 miles away from our base, which is already remote. And when you get to that lake, there's the old, there's one cabin. So we fly Americans, um, or primarily Americans from the Midwest, uh, up for a week long flying fishing. They catch a couple hundred fish and they have a great time. But to get there, you have to fly in, and to get all the, the boats and cabins and food and, and everything up there, everything has to be flown on the airplane. So, uh, you know, when you build the cabin, you do lots of lumber flights, and then and then you gotta build, uh, you gotta fly fuel tanks up there, you have to fly, uh, you know, the, the fridge, uh, stoves, everything. The boats all have to make it. But most things fit inside the airplane. But uh, boats, they don't fit inside, so they go on the outside of the plane. Um, and the, the reason they're on backwards there is just because uh, with the, they're on a beaver there, so uh, with the transom being flat, if it was on proper with the with the bow forward, the air would come over the transom and create a lot of uh, vortices on the tail, and it would make it very hard to control the plane. So the way that the SEC is written, the boats have to be on uh, backwards, and then they fly. A little bit slower, but they fly like you, you don't even know that they're on there. Yeah, I think the, the power of those airplanes is just I insane. Like, what 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 type of uh, engines do they have on there, and what, what power are they putting out? Uh, Pratt & Whitney um, 985, which is 450 horsepower. That's on the Beaver. And then the Otter has... Uh, well, our Otter is slightly different. It's... Uh, a, some people have standard otters, but not too many people have standard otters, which is about 650 horsepower. Uh, most people have uh, either retrofitted to turbine, um, which is 750 with a PT6. Uh, ours has a, still has a radial nine cylinder, but it's a it's a Polish, and it's actually a thousand horsepower. Um, so that otter really pulls. Yeah, that that would be a beast to fly. It's the same airplane with the 600 horsepower. It's just just a bigger engine, so it, it can do a lot more, that's for sure. Awesome. And sorry, the other thing, I, I mentioned there was two types of flying that we do. The other type that's not the uh, flying fishing is uh, we uh, we go to quite a few uh, flying only uh, First Nation re reservations uh, up north, so everything on the community has to be flown in on planes. And up until 
uh, several years ago, there was never any runway. So that's how bushfire kind of got its start, was everything had to be flown in up there. So uh, any boats, or, like they basically live up there all the time. Their house is up there, everything. So imagine everything you have in your house needs to be flown up on an airplane. Now there's bigger airplanes, but we still go up there almost a couple times a day. And, uh, yeah, so we still fly all kinds of things. And then when they go into the bush to do to their trap line, uh, get some moose meat or fish or a goose hunt in the spring, whatever they need to get to supply for their family, we fly them out there. And then you have to fly that back as well. Well, that's, uh, that's a lot of flying. How many hours can you, can you expect to fly in a season? Uh, it depends where you work. Most, uh, um, there's, there's certain companies that, like for flying fishing that just have, you know, just a handful of outposts and they only do their own flying. And places like that, you're kind of only expect, expecting probably about two to 300 hours uh, in a summer, uh, so six months. Um, both places I've worked are uh, uh, in Air Service Plus. Uh, plus have their, well, sorry, where I work now is Air Service Plus, their own. Um, outpost, but where I worked before was just at Slate Falls. That was just an air service, and we just did charter work for other people's outposts. But both of those places, you're kind of looking in, in uh, it just depends if they're short pilots or not, but anywhere between five to, you know, 750 hours in the summer, which uh, six months. So it's, it's a fair amount of flying. It's, it's every day. You normally start at about five in the morning, and, and, and you fly all day. So that that would be as like an experienced float pilot, as an entry level float pilot. What do you what do you think you would be doing in a in a summer? Yeah, I think an entry level, uh, you know, like um, my first year, I did uh, I did 500. Uh, that was that was with working the dock, but that was also a very busy summer at the end. So you know, uh, yeah, probably probably anywhere. Most entry float pilots would probably do between you know three to five hundred hours. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very busy job. Like, it, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. You you definitely have to be a hardworking person and just be willing to learn with with no qualms about jumping in and, and hands-on work. Yeah, and, and you know, like uh, like I said, the, the outposts are really far away. So, so, like, where I work now, there are our own outposts. So, you're the pilot, and when you drop off the, the guest, uh, and you're picking up, you, you always drop off and pick up the next group. So... If if the previous group had a problem with something, you you have to fix it. So while you're there, you you have to troubleshoot. You you kind of got to be uh, good at, at fixing maybe a motor or uh, you know like a propane has to be swapped, things like that. You might have to cut the grass while you're there because um, it takes a long time and a lot of money to fly you know a couple hundred miles just to go just go cut the grass. So uh, just you're not just a pilot either when when you're working at these places. You have yeah. to do a lot of other other work as well. You're doing a little bit of everything. Yeah, um, and that's that's really what I like. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at a picture here with the with the plane on ice. Can you tell me a little bit about taking off from ice or or why it would be on ice? Yeah, so that picture is actually in Red Lake, uh, and the reason that is is because uh, uh, well, actually Red Lake freezes like really thick in that bay there so when everything else melts and you can fly on floats everywhere else there's still lots of ice so uh, when you pick up your plane in the spring you have to you either have to wait for all the ice to melt and then float it in or you can where it is in red lake where you might wait another few weeks that's a few weeks that you could be working so uh, you fly it off the ice and uh, you basically just Kind of like filing off like water, but it won't climb up on top of the water because it's already on top. So you just kind of trim it off and let it fly itself off real nice. And it's super, super loud because the ice is just, uh, you know, just scraping across, across the bottom of the floats real loud. So it's not like water or anything. It's real loud, but you only have to do it about once a year. And, and most places uh, don't do that, you know, if they're in a town where, you know, if you're on a river or something, the river would always open up first. So you could launch in the river or or maybe you know you could just you can afford to wait the extra couple of weeks and wait for the wait for all the ice to go for sure now what do you what do you do in the winter since you don't fly when there's ice really um what what do you do as a as a float pilot uh well my actually my first job uh at slate falls uh, they fly all year round so uh we put the 206 on uh we put one 206 on wheels and the other one on skis 
and then the uh, turbine otter that they have, it goes on skis as well. And um, we were, we had a scheduled uh, uh, flight, actually four, uh, up to Cat Lake First Nations every day. So so we'd fly up their supplies. They had uh, medical patients. There's no hospital on, on the reservation. So, so we'd fly uh, people to go to the doctor's office, and, and then we'd fly them back, and we'd fly nurses up there. Uh, all of their supplies, groceries, things like that. That was a pretty um, standard thing to do in the winter. And then with the ski flying, uh, there's just there's government contracts, fuel hauls, things to do for the summer. Uh, and then in the spring, there's uh, the spring goose hunt. Uh, so you go off of other uh, reservations and, and bring them into the bush to get, get the uh, geese. But uh, at Clark's, they don't have any airplanes on in the winter so last winter i took the winter off and just plowed snow that's what most people do they'll either get a job flying instruments or on wheels or or you just take the winter off and uh, plow snow drive drive a truck do do other things sometimes uh, you know it's a real busy in the summer so people with a family like to just take it off and spend time with their with their family I can see why you always return back to floats, though. Like, looking at some of the pictures that you've taken here and shared with us, they are absolutely gorgeous. Like, there's there's nowhere else you can get a picture like that with the plane on the lake at sunrise. Like, it's it's beautiful. Yeah, and you know what? Yeah, I'd say it's pretty rare that you actually get a picture because most of the time you, you're flying someplace else because you're scared <laughs> of dropping it in the water and... Or, or you're busy flying and you look and you, you really appreciate it, but then you never think to take a picture. So just, uh, there is some nice pictures, but there's definitely a lot more that you're missing. Well, we're definitely lucky you got a, you got a few good ones. Um, all, I, I also think it's very interesting that you, that you mentioned, like you're flying in nurses and doctors and groceries. Like you, you guys are the, the lifeline to the north as, as float pilots and bush pilots. Yeah, up until a couple of years ago, there was no runways on any of that reservation, so it was all full pilots. Uh, that's that's how everything in this area got its start. Uh, you know, everything had to be flown in on on a plane, and uh, you know, it's definitely changed a lot. Uh, now there's runways, so there's bigger airplanes. You don't have to fly as much on the smaller ones, but uh, yeah, it's still you know everything uh, everything that goes up there. There's no roads, uh, so everything has to be flown in. And that's why it's so expensive to, to be up there, too, because all of these places are hundreds and hundreds of miles away, and, and everything goes on a plane, and you can only put so much on the plane. You can only take so much weight. For sure. What What would you say is your, your parting wisdom for someone that's looking to, to get into float flying or someone that uh, that doesn't even know where to get started? Like, what, what would you tell a new pilot that's just looking to start off? Well, uh, I guess, you know, just uh, um, look online and ask around and, uh, you know, feel free to ask me any questions um, and, you know, just uh, uh, do what you want to do because it is hard work, so you might not want to do it your whole life, but it's definitely fun, very rewarding, and uh, it's a total different type of flying that I think. I think, you know, if you were at an airline at the end of your career, you would... Uh, you'd probably be looking back on the days that you're out uh, doing this kind of full flying. So I would say just do it and, uh, you know, ask around and, and and just go different places. You can always drive and hand out resumes and, and just check things out and offer to work for the day while you're there, you know, and, and uh, yeah, just, you know, just do it, I guess. Awesome. Andrew, thank you so much. I know you had an incredibly busy day. You were fighting 30 knot winds today, and after after doing a 12, 13 hour day of uh, of just battling everything you're battling today, you still made the time to talk to us. So I I really appreciate that. Yeah, no worries, no worries at all. Uh, my pleasure. Sorry you couldn't do the live video though. No, no, that's okay. You're you're really far up north. We're happy to just get your knowledge and get you on the phone here. No problem. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to feel free to ask me. I'm here to help anyone get get their start. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Andrew. No worries. Thanks. Bye for now. Bye.